Greetings, wondrous ones. Celery juice is already down the hatch, so I've moved on to my watermelon juice as my morning routine uh, here in Costa Rica. Mm. Got it. Watermelon juice is so friggin' healthy for you. If you aren't in the know, you don't need a juicer. You just need a really good, well, not even a really good blender. Watermelon is the meat of watermelon so soft and filled with minerals, electrolytes. Mm. Anyhow, today I'm with you for another quick spiritual wisdom warrior chat here about another pertinent subject as I'm continuing on in this theme, you know, with Pluto entering into Aquarius. Now we are in a collective shadow work scenario for the next 20 years. And just to refresh your memory, Pluto, Lord of the Underworld, this is like the shadow work that is clearing the space so that when we enter deeper into the fulfillment of the Age of Aquarius, which is really about restoring the divine sense of our humanity and our world and our universe, uh, a true enlightenment culture, technologies that are actually useful for us, uh, that those things will be coming into much more clear fruition, but we have to do this shadow work first, the next 20 years. So on that note, I've been doing a few of these talks, just calling things in that may be a little darker or shadier for us to look at, uh, because this is the work of maturation. We need to really be keenly aware of where our shortcomings are, and we need to be very assiduous, like hardworking and willing to do this work. So today I want to just talk about a subject that's just been on my mind uh, recently because I had an experience with this very thing of witnessing people who have been partaking in a lot of plant medicine ceremonies, working with entheogens like ayahuasca, for example, and just noticing that people are coming out of some of these ceremonies with very inflated egos, uh, a lot of spiritual grandiosity, which is one of the most dangerous expressions of the ego on this path that we are on and i want to be very nuanced in this talk because i i for one have benefited a lot from plant medicines and psychedelics i wouldn't necessarily regard them as primary tools for my spiritual path i've been on a spiritual path for for over 20 years now after i had an awakening in my final year of university, which had nothing to do with um, substances or psychedelics. It was really brought on through revelations and studies that I was doing in Eastern mysticism and quantum physics at the time. Um, but I have partaken in ayahuasca and working with psychedelics in therapeutic settings, and they have been very useful for me. And this is not a throwing the the whole thing out the window here, because I think these uh, substances, these plant medicine spirits are profoundly integral to the awakening process that's happening right now on earth. But that being said, we must err on the side of caution. And I have been a little concerned about this realm because there is seemingly a lot, it's very vogue. It's very vogue, it's very popular, and a lot of people are attracted to it, and a lot of people are doing it. And I am noticing an increasing number of unintegrated shadows coming out of this, this realm of plant medicine and psychedelic work. And, and I just want to name that and provide some of my own pers humble perspectives, guidance on this. Um, I'm not a plant medicine expert by any means, so there are people out there who do this work, who are plant medicine integrative therapists. Those people are amazing. They're really focusing in on this very subject because this is uh, a challenge and a problem. So a bit of really interesting historical background that I, I find very um, inspiring. So if you follow some of my work, you know I've been a real student of the Nag Hammadi Library of the ancient mystery schools of Eurasia. And in these ancient mystery schools, of which the pyramids of Egypt, for example, were some of the initiate temples, uh, there are legends that when initiates were ready, they would go into the Egyptian pyramids for sometimes upwards to a month, and they'd be taken through different chambers, different psychodramas, different fasting, different spiritual practices, 
um, to initiate their consciousness to and, and truly the ancients were masters at knowing how to enthuse to alter to amplify consciousness and to align it with experiences that would have deep impacts on the development of that person so that when they would come out of these ceremonies these initiations they would be deemed in some cultures what were called telestai which means those who are aimed meaning those who are aimed towards a transpersonal purpose and they would be serving that purpose serving the society serving the culture in a very noble way for the rest of their life because of what they experienced in these initiation ceremonies i find it interesting this historical anecdote that they would also partake of an entheogen a psychedelic plant medicine called the kikion that was given to them in a grail cup so the whole idea of the holy grail this one grail cup that became this kind of um, obsession this material obsession with this object is actually a, a, a huge misnomer it was actually speaking to more the ceremony that these grail cups were a part of which was this initiation ceremony where they would drink this brew called the kikion and when the initiates would drink this brew they would see one of the great mysteries of our world which is called the organic light they would see the living light of Sophia which is the earth goddess the goddess of wisdom as well and they would see her light pervading everything even in their own bodies and they have this revelation that we are living in the soul of the mother the anima mundi of the great earth the interesting anecdote I find relevant to this discussion is they would have to train sometimes upwards to 20 years just to drink this plant medicine once they would not drink it you know for a whole bunch of ayahuasca retreats for the whole year they would drink it one time because they had trained for 20 years to have the capacity to have this one experience and it would aim them towards this purpose and it would align them and write them uh, in such a powerful way so i find that very interesting and then of course in the king arthur mythology which is kind of this pagan uh, western mythology that, that encapsulates a lot of these mystery school teachings um, which became heavily distorted because you know a lot of the pagan mythologies were persecuted and, and kind of erased out of human consciousness by the rise of the judeo-christian empire uh, but if you remember in, in one of the legends when the the gallant knights of the round table are sent out to search for the holy grail um, which is actually more of a metaphor of western culture re re-seeking seeking these ancient initiation experiences rather than searching for this grail cup this object of of great uh, elixir uh, a great mana for the human soul uh, but the experience that the cup provided was that elixir and that mana and the, one of the first knights to find it was Sir Galahad and Galahad drank of the cup and immediately went into bliss and died and ascended to heaven and again this is uh, a teaching that Galahad was not yet ready he was not yet prepared for the overwhelming experience of the entheogen which was going to expand and amplify his consciousness to such a degree it re reminds me as well in the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna is kind of at the tail end of his teachings from or rather Arjuna is at the tail ends of receiving teachings from the the god Krishna and he asked Krishna you know I'd love to see you in your true form because Krishna is just appearing as this kind of humble chariot driver <clears throat> and if you remember Krishna appears to Arjuna in all his infinite glory and it's too much to bear and it's like the ter terrible beauty which is what the mystery schools used to call this experience of and anyone who's done plant medicines uh, I had this experience too I, on ayahuasca where you're in such awe you're kind of like it's so beautiful it's terrifying and uh, of course Arjuna's like please no more I can't I can't take it I don't have the capacity and to just stay in kind of the yoga culture just to really really drive this point home because uh, I, I am a yoga teacher I don't really practice or teach anymore but I did my training and I used to teach for a few years uh, and the eight limbs of yoga one of the reasons that we practice yoga this yoking the mind and the body together the asanas all the moral principles and such um, is that we're, we're actually focusing on cleansing and cleaning the body of all the obstructions what are known as the psychic scars or the samskaras so that when kundalini is awakened 
and these higher frequencies of consciousness are awakened, we have the capacity to hold those energies and we don't blow out our circuits, blow out our nervous system. In Chinese medicine, the nervous system, the nerves are called shen jing, which means the wires that conduct spirit. So it's a, it's a kind of spiritual electricity that happens. And when we aren't uh, ready for it, as you may have seen, I've, I've met people who have had premature Kundalini awakenings, um, their nervous system is, is fried and they deal with a lot of mental illness because they were not yet ready for this. So this is something to just bear in mind. You know, I, my greatest spiritual experiences have happened outside of plant medicine and psychedelics. Now, I think these experiences can be really good to, as Aldous Huxley said, you know, can lift the veils, it can open the doors of perception, um, which is very profound. I think in some ways that's the most essential utility for a lot of these substances because we are living in a world that condition, uh, conditions us with mind control to be completely unaware of the higher mystical spiritual realms, which are more authentically what is going on in our universe. So when you take psychedelics, especially if it's in a really appropriate container where this stuff can really be um, utilized in a very beautiful and useful way, you see behind the veils and you can have this experience of a more ultimate reality and that can be very transformational and very life-changing. But for me, uh, those experiences may have enthused and opened things, but for me, most of my spiritual practices and the great revelations of spirituality that have really positively transformed my life on such a deep essential level have come out of practices of presence, uh, meditation, prayer, um, doing acts of kindness, being compassionate, being ethical, being very disciplined. The practice of presence I want to return to, I see as kind of like the foundation of all spiritual practice. And it really means being steadfastly very present to with your consciousness, not drifting and daydreaming constantly in temporal time of past future, where a lot of our true agony happens because we're constantly drifting away from the grounded moment. And when we're present, we actually hook into this much more divine consciousness, divine mind. You really have to experience for yourself and those of you who know presence through meditation and awareness practices, you know that when you become present, that it's like these insights just come immediately. You have a much more excellent frame of mind. Your, your mind is expanded. You become more intelligent, more wise. Um, but that takes practice day in and day out to build that relationship to these higher forms of consciousness. Plant medicine and psychedelics on one hand is a bit lazy because anyone can do them. Anyone can buy a head of acid or can drink ayahuasca. There's no effort really there. There has to, of course, be a willingness to maybe go through the change, the, the ordeal that can happen when you take these medicines. But after the plant medicines have done, it's like the old samurai teaching, like after you achieve enlightenment, it goes back to just, you know, carrying the water and doing the work. And that is highly, highly important. And there's this real problem right now in the world because we're still in this capitalistic system. So a lot of the uh, merit of someone to do a ceremony is based on do they have the money to do it? It's not like do they have the capacity to hold the ceremony? And that's where I get a little concerned because I've seen not only just participants, but I've seen practitioners who have huge spiritual egos, huge shadow, and then they're in the ceremony as the main conductors and they're transmitting a lot of this to other people. So it's just a messy time to be on planet Earth for sure, but just to err on the side of caution, to make sure that who you are drinking with, who, if you're doing a, a plant medicine ceremony like ayahuasca, make sure you really check out the shaman. A good shaman will welcome that. They will welcome being questioned. They will be very humble so make sure that these are very ethical, uh, very noble people because you're going to be literally handing them your consciousness to basically kind of ply and need and play with. Uh, and you want to be with someone who's going to be having your best interest in mind and just going to be humble and just going to serve um, the greater good for that ceremony. And, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing right now because being a shaman is so cool, right? And with social media and... Uh, I just did a post on this on my Instagram as well about, you know, how we use social media to seek validation. 
Um, this is the big epidemic we have right now is that social media has absolutely caused a dopamine deficiency, a reward deficiency in, in, our, in our inner chemistry. And the challenge is, is that people don't realize that they have this kind of internal vacuity, this internal emptiness that is actually driven and caused by constantly using social media and projecting and externalizing our energy outwards in this strange kind of pseudo world where we are validated through likes, through hearts, um, and our sense of worth is all of a sudden out there and it's judged out there by how many followers we have and how much engagement we have. And I mean, going back to the spiritual practice, presence is absolutely decimated by this because we're constantly in a, hey, the irony of it, because I'm using social media right now, of course, we're kind of entangled in this ironic thing. Uh, but that is one of the problems as well, is that we're constantly projecting ourselves outward. So it's a problem as well with spirituality becoming somewhat cool now, is that, and I've seen this, I've seen people drink one cup of ayahuasca, one experience, and afterwards they're like, I've seen everything, I'm awakened, and they think just because they've seen beyond the veils, they've all of a sudden become this highly enlightened being. And, uh, and from there you can see this grandiosity becoming uh, very problematic. Whereas to me, true spirituality, the true spiritual path is this balance of, yes, enthusing and encouraging the expansion of our consciousness so we can really see this much greater world that we're a part of. But within that, there's this humility, this erosion of the ego so that we start to orbit this greater transpersonal purpose where we don't see ourselves as being like, wow, I am this amazing enlightened being, uh, which we all you know, are. But when we get too over-identified with that and we start to think we're superior to others, uh, that's that's a problem and the true spiritual work of day in and day out of really like making sure your relationships are in the right order that you're taking care of your yourself that you're constantly eroding the force of your shadow and transmuting it into light and becoming a more balanced being more virtuous these are the true merits not how many ceremonies you've done how many incredible insightful revelations you've had during those ceremonies um, and of course, yeah, the problem is I'm seeing this kind of uh, lassitude in spirituality where people are kind of misinterpreting that when they drink or take a bunch of psychedelics and they have all these amazing um, experiences that that makes them more spiritual than others. And that's really not the case. It's just opening our eyes to the great spiritual world, which is profound. And then the work is to live up to those visions, you know. To be spiritual means to be in relationship with spirit, which is the unified energy that unites all things. So it means we're going to be more unified and more harmonic in our relationships with ourselves, with our relationships with our friends, with our family, with the earth, with all the life forms of the earth. It's going to be this constant cultivation of more oneness, of more unity. Um, and that's really the work of constantly humbling ourselves, constantly being in service. And... Um, and ego is, spiritual ego is a really big problem. And this is why as well in, ego, in, uh, in yoga and a lot of these plant medicines, if someone hasn't done a lot of the work, there is always the issue that these experiences could inflate one's shadow, could inflate one's wounds, could inflate one's trauma. So it would be nice if there was a lot more uh, discernment of is a person ready to partake in these ceremonies and I'll tell you right now you don't need plant medicine you don't need psychedelics um, these are not a necessity for one's spiritual growth I know so many people who are incredible beings incredibly kind loving virtuous contributors to the world who have had so many spiritual awakenings just through vipassana just through meditation so just bear that in mind they can be useful in the right context. It's not to say that they shouldn't be used at all. They can be very useful in the right context. And I think the reason that they're so popular right now is a part of this need. We're in a kind of emergency on planet Earth right now where we, we all do need to have this awakening process. But just just be cautious, just be careful. Uh, and, and really take the time to be not only in the integration, but to seek out that you are living your life 
with spiritual practices that you are devotedly doing each day to keep you on this path of becoming a more harmonic and virtuous human being. Virtue in Chinese medicine means the magnificent impulses. So we want to be exuding the magnificent impulses of things like kindness, benevolence, of living with courage. Uh, these kinds of virtues are very important to cultivate. And that's not going to be cultivated by drinking or doing psychedelics. They're going to open our eyes to things. But the true cultivation is working day in and day out in what one of my teachers said, the spiritual gymnasium of daily life. The spiritual gymnasium of daily life. I, I love that sentiment a lot. All right, I'm going to stop here, folks. So just some words out there. If anyone has any comments or questions, I'll just remain on and very serenely sip the rest of my watermelon juice here. Definitely get this in your body. You don't even need a juicer, as I said at the beginning. You just need a really good blender. Super healthy, super healing. If you're just popping in, now and you miss this talk don't worry it'll be up on my gram momentarily after we finish here but if there's any questions or comments i thought this was a really important topic to talk about um yeah i've seen some things very recently that were very triggering people who have drank way too much ayahuasca and made some very grave misinterpretations during those ceremonies and then i guess didn't have a container afterwards of people to hold them accountable you know that's why it's always important to have people in your life that you go to <coughs> for feedback because spiritual egotism and spiritual grandiosity we're all vulnerable to them i've had lots of dealings with my own spiritual ego and spiritual grandiosity i'm going to be teaching an online workshop at some point on this i used to in the past based on robert moore's book um facing the dragon which is all about dealing with spiritual grandiosity. All right, well, I'm going to leave it there, folks. Sending you beautiful love, wisdom, and uh, I hope you have a blessed day. And I'll see you next time.